Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex, and as you can tell, I am quite discombobulated by a potential film that we might have watched. With me, as always, is Noel. How are you doing, Noel? Hello. <laughs> I am doing fine. I am also slightly discombobulated. And we're here to discuss. What are we here to discuss? Halloween, parentheses six. They did not put a six in the title. I don't know why. It's just Halloween... The curse, the curse of Michael of Myers. Michael Myers. <laughs> Though the original script was titled Halloween 666. Oh, really? Of course. Of course. Instead, Dimension was like, let's give that to Children of the Corn. There you go. Alex, had you ever seen Halloween 6 before? I have. I don't think I saw this particular cut that we're going to discuss first, but I have seen it before. Yes, it, was, it has been a long time. I have seen it as well. Back in you know the 90s when I watched all the films, I probably saw this one about a year after it came out because around 96, 97 was when I was renting them all from Blockbuster. And yeah, the producer's cut, Halloween 6, is infamous for having two significantly different cuts. It's not one of those ones where they just went in and you know, like added like five minutes of gore or something. 43 minutes of this movie are different takes <laughs> in the producer's cut than they are in the theatrical cut. So there are entirely different scenes than what's in the theatrical cut because they went in and did a whole bunch of reshoots. And they are so significant that what we're doing here today is Alex and I have watched the producer's cut because that came first. And we'll meet up again a week later and we'll have watched the theatrical cut. Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing for you people. <laughs> Again, yeah, I watched the theatrical cut back in the 90s and, you know, late 90s was started getting on the internet, started seeing fan groups, started seeing fan forums. So that's when I started hearing about the producer's cut. And even though I, I knew some like comic shops that have like a box full of bootleg movies of all that stuff, I never came across the producer's cut. By the time it probably started circulating on the internet, I had kind of drifted away from Halloween for a while, mostly because Rob Zombie was making them. <laughs> so this is my first time watching the producer's cut. It's interesting how much does still line up with what I remember from the old movie, but also there are some significant changes. And I should mention that I've kind of avoided reading up what are the actual changes between the cut, because I figure we'll get into that next week when we actually watch that. Mm -hmm. And so I've also kind of avoided, I didn't listen to any of the commentaries yet. I didn't watch any of the documentaries yet. I kind of even skipped a chunk of the Wikipedia page because I don't want to know what changed yet. When we pick up for the second half of the episode, I probably will have gone through all that and we'll have more to say. Sounds good. I'll also save the box office business until then, too. So if anyone's waiting to hear that, it'll be next week, which is probably going to happen in 40 minutes. <laughs> it's convoluted. <laughs> yes. So what I do have in terms of some production details, just a little bit, the film was again executive produced by Mustafa Akkad through his company, Troncus International, who was joined for the first time in the franchise by his son, Malik Akkad, who is going to become a familiar name as he will gradually take over the franchise. There were plans to do a sixth film immediately following the release of Halloween 5 in 1989, but a whole legal battle blew up with past producers and distributors stalling the film for half a decade in terms of who owned what rights. So it's kind of like how following 1989, John Carpenter wasn't able to make a film for six years because he got stuck in legal battles. Same with Halloween. Like father, like son. So what ultimately happened was Dimension, which was the branch of Miramax, the company owned by the Weinstein brothers. They purchased most of the rights and they will be the ones who continue producing Halloween films up until Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. And they've actually only just this year, as of 2016, have lost the rights. Wow. So following this point, any future Halloween films will be made by other people. And I know they've already talked that they got John is going to be taking part in a potential new one as a producer and potentially composer. We'll see. It's exciting. Several ideas were floated around for part six, but the one they ultimately went with came from the fan community when Daniel Ferrans managed to slip a fan script he wrote to producer Paul Freeman, who also worked on part four. 
this is an interesting thing because I said I got into the Halloween internet fan communities in the late 90s. And I noticed they were kind of unique in that they were full of fan scripts. Mm. You know, not fan fiction, but fan scripts. Like someone writing like, here's my version of Halloween 7. And after Halloween 7 came out, here's my version of Halloween 8. You know, here's how we can tie everything together. I, I know there was a whole group of fans that even put together like a Halloween the TV series. Okay. Because, you know, Freddy had a TV series. There oh, was he Friday sure the 13th, a Poltergeist series. There was a Poltergeist series? <laughs> yeah, Poltergeist the Legacy. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was in the 90s. All right. That and Stargate debuted as part of the same block. Wow. Anyways, yeah, I remember fans even put together like an entire season of like Halloween the series. And most of them weren't very good. Some were, (laughs) some weren't. It was typical fan fiction. Some of it's good, some of it's not. And I'm wondering if that's the result of this, where a fan managed to actually sell a fan script. So all these other fans are like, here, I'm going to follow suit. I'm going to put out my fan (laughs) script and build support and maybe get it in front of the producers. Suffice it to say, it never happens again. Yeah. None of the other Halloween films start that way. They probably learned their lesson from this (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Ferrans has since gone on to write and produce other horror films, The Tooth Fairy, The Girl Next Door, which is based on the Jack Ketchum novel, not the comedy of the same name, and Havenhurst, as well as producing The Haunting in Connecticut, The Trouble with the Truth, The Id, and the upcoming Amityville The Awakening. Wow. I've heard of one of those projects. And Alex, do you know those massive, massive documentaries that have been done, Never Sleep Again on Aunt Mary Elm Street and Crystal Lake Memories on Friday the 13th? Yes, that's precisely why. I haven't actually watched them because of their runtime, which I will eventually, but yeah. Yeah, like five and seven hours and all stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel Ferrans directed and produced those. There you go. Those are his works. So, I mean, I think he is an incredibly knowledgeable fan. Mm -hmm. He obviously does tons of research. He likes to definitely dig out everyone who was ever involved with anything, find out their side of things. And to a degree, I can see elements of that in here, and we'll probably discuss that. Absolutely, yeah. I have a few theories about how maybe that's not such a great thing, knowing too much about your property. Yeah, and apparently when he showed up to pitch it he showed up with like reams of like family trees and timelines oh wow like he wrote an entire massive origin story that we only get glimpses of here and so definitely something he put a lot of heart and work into anyways this is the second film from director joe chappelle after his thriller thieves quartet after halloween six he went on to direct the legendary film adaptation of dean kuntz's phantoms oh well i heard ben affleck was the bomb in that you (laughs) His career surprisingly survived beyond that, (laughs) as he directed Hackers 2 The Takedown, What? The Skulls 2, Dark Prince The Story of Dracula, and lately he's become a prominent producer and director on shows like The Wire, CSI Miami, Fringe, and Chicago Fire. That's all that I have right now for production notes. Again, when we get to the second half of the theatrical, I'll probably have some more. Uh, Otherwise, anything else you want to add before I jump into the synopsis? No, no, not at all. Uh, This is an interesting one to sum up. Yeah, I'm I'm very curious. and I'm (laughs) waiting with bated breath for this. A lot's happened since that night of the police station massacre where Jamie Lloyd and Michael Myers disappeared and were presumed dead. In reality, they were held in the underground catacombs of the Cult of the Thorn, an ancient group preserving the druidic rite of bringing peace to their community by, on every Samhain Eve, they would possess a child with a demon so that he'll sacrifice his entire family and thus again preserve the community. Michael was one such child, but since he never completed the ritual, has carried on tracking members of his bloodline down, unable to die until the final victim is slain. During her capture, Jamie was impregnated with the seed of Michael, I'm glad they never explained how, Mm -hmm. and her baby is intended to be Michael's final victim so the evil force can pass on to a new child. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Right. Out in the world, the real estate business of Laurie Strode's family went under, and the passing of her father left all debts on her uncle John, who moved his family into the Myers' house because its reputation made it unable to sell. John has become a bitter asshole at all his failures and takes it out on his daughter Kara, a college student who recently had to move back in with Danny, a six-year-old son she had as a teenager. Danny has begun dreaming about the symbol of the thorn and killing his family, and is starting to exhibit moments of coldness similar to when Michael was young. The night before Halloween, Jamie Lloyd and her baby escape from the catacombs and Michael is released to pursue. She makes it quite a ways before she's cut down, but managed to stash her baby in a bathroom and call a shock jock radio host for help in a message that was heard by both Tommy Doyle, the boy from the first film who now obsessively spies on the Myers house to watch for Michael's return, and the elderly Dr. Loomis, who was quietly living in retirement until his old colleague Dr. Wynn returned to reveal he's stepping down as the head of Smith's Grove and wants Loomis to take over. 
We're almost done. Most of my synopsis was backstory. <laughs> Most of this movie's backstory. Yeah. <laughs> Loomis clashes with the local cops who don't want to believe Michael is on his way back, even as Jamie, clinging to life after surgery, is executed in her hospital bed by the mysterious stranger in a trench coat and hat from part five. Tommy manages to track down the baby and takes it in as he finally makes contact with Kara and Danny, helping them survive as the rest of the Strode household, not to mention that shock shock, are brutally cut down. Dr. Wynn is ultimately revealed to be the mysterious stranger, and other members of the cast to be the Cult of Thorn as Danny and Kara are captured and brought to the catacombs, which are revealed to be the basement of Smith's Grove Asylum, where Michael is to kill the baby so the evil force can be passed on to Danny, who is meant to kill his mother as his first victim. Breaking into the hospital, Loomis takes on Wynn, who tries to lure him to the Thorn side, and Tommy uses a set of druidic ruins to try to cancel out the evil power. All that he's actually able to do is trap Michael in a magic circle as everyone gets away, except for Loomis, who insists on going back to encounter his former patient. <laughs> the figure lying on the ground turns out to actually be that of Dr. Wynn, with Michael having swapped into the hat and jacket of the mysterious stranger. As Wynn passes the mark of the thorn onto Loomis, the old doctor screams as best as Donald Pleasance is able. <laughs> so Alex, do you recommend the producer's cut of Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers? Uh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not only is this the worst Halloween film, it is one of the worst films I have ever seen in my entire life. It is an incomprehensible, detestable <laughs> pile of garbage. It, it's inept. It's an absolutely atrocious film. I hated every <laughs> second of it and kind of resent this entire podcast for making me watch this film. And I don't like getting into this apoplectic nerd rage, but my God, was it an awful, awful awful deplorable film <laughs> and you get to watch it twice i know i was so angry because i could barely hold on for the last like 30 minutes which felt like seven years of my life and i'm just like oh my god i could barely pay attention so no <laughs> partial not recommend <laughs> i also do not recommend the movie though not as vehemently as you do and that's in large part because I still remember watching Halloween 5. Right. I do think this is a step up from Halloween 5. Ooh, interesting. I don't think it's a good movie. I think it has a lot of things that it does wrong, but I think it's trying. I think it's making a valiant attempt to try to pull everything together and give a reason for everything, albeit in ways that are wrong. Yeah. But I also think the direction is competent, especially compared to part 5. I actually think it's pretty decently directed. Hmm. But I mean, there's other technical things that I have problems with, but I didn't dislike watching it as much as I thought I would. Well, that's totally fair. But I recognize that it's not good. <laughs> I'd put it just below part four. Okay. But it's definitely above part five for me. Part five, I hated. I hated part five. <laughs> I also hated part five, but this, I just, I really hated this. <laughs> well, let's move into it. Let's talk about the Cult of the Thorn. Yes. As you did the um, synopsis, I was confused for a second because I'm like, why have this baby, which I assume was forced onto Jamie, leaving the complete ickiness of that plot point aside for a second. So the baby is to be sacrificed to pass on the mark of the thorn to another child? She's the last of Michael's bloodline, so he will no longer have to be Michael. So why not just kill Jamie and why have this child because it just seems to be making another baby. I know. Why not just have done that six years ago? Yeah, just do that ritual with Jamie. Don't add another layer to this complicated uh... yeah, Let's add to the bloodline. <laughs> exactly. That's very, very peculiar to me. I never even realized that. For a second, I didn't even realize that was Jamie. I thought Jamie was the other woman who was introduced. The Strode young lady. What's oh, her yeah, name? Kara. Kara, yeah. I was very confused. Yeah, and I have to be, my memory of this film from watching it in the 90s was that the reason why Michael is going after them again is because this is the Strode family who adopted Lori and thus they are now part of his family and that's why he has to kill them. Which kind of makes sense, yeah. But that's actually not what's going on at all. They're just kind of in the way. Exactly, yeah. He just, oh no, wait, he sees everyone who stays in his house as his family. Well, and it's also there between him and getting the baby, though why he can't just go ahead and attack that house and take the baby, I don't know. Yeah, and by this logic, until that house is knocked down, he's always going to have someone who's staying there that is now part of his family. Which we will get to in Halloween resurrection. <laughs> Absolutely. But as for the Cult of the Thorn, I guess, yeah, as you were saying, it was an admirable attempt to uh, try to make sense of what they were going through in part five with the stranger. That's actually not the part that I meant as an admirable attempt. 
Oh, well, I mean, like... Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Them making it so everything is all tied in, that the Cult of the Thorn was responsible for the events back in 1963, but this cult is playing a long game for sure. Yeah. To what end, I don't even know, but I guess, yeah, to make it so that they made the curse, Michael was the one who got... I don't know why they chose Michael or the Strode slash Myers family, but yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like, try to over-explain, they also under-explain. <laughs> what I do like about it is how it explains why Michael is so mission-oriented and why he almost can't die. Yeah, no, that does make sense because they never really indicate that he's a supernatural force until later in the series, so I guess that does tie things together, but then it also kind of makes the first movie less special because the whole point of what I liked about it was that it was in Carpenter style just an incident as we discussed in earlier episodes. Yeah, it was just, hey this is a person that I saw standing in front of my house one day. Yeah, exactly. Let's go ruin her life. Exactly and that's super terrifying whereas this is less terrifying that it's this conspiracy that it's not as chaotic, it's not as random as terrifying incidents often are. I have this whole thing against fandom can be pretty bad because they want to make sense of properties that don't have to make sense of sometimes, or they want to tie in together properties that might not make sense because they didn't really put that much creative effort into it, like the Friday the 13th films. So therefore, it kind of takes away or overcomplicates certain elements of those franchises when they're just supposed to be popcorn films like roller coaster rides. Yeah, they sometimes think that because you're connecting threads, that's being clever, mm -hmm. as opposed to just telling a good story. Exactly. Yeah, they miss out on the major elements of storytelling, which is great dialogue and good story. There is no good story here. There's just a lot of thought. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. That pretty much sums up exactly my ramblings. <laughs> to get into what I like about The Cult of the Thorn, I had forgotten the big twist involving Dr. Wynn. Right. But Dr. Wynn has been a recurring... He, he's popped up. He had a little bit in part one. He had a little bit in part two. He had a little bit in part four. So it's kind of neat to bring him back and reveal he's been a bigger part of things. Right. And I love that they recast him with Mitchell Ryan, who is one of those great distinctive character actors. Well, I've been watching Dark Shadows recently, and he was one of the main cast members in the original Dark Shadows back in the 60s. Oh, cool. Every time I would read... Because, you know, I read the scripts to all these Halloween films before I watch them. Right. This was no exception. Every time I get to the Dr. Wynn character, I've been picturing this actor. Oh, interesting. And I kept forgetting that he actually did play him in part six, because then I'd watch the movie and it's like, oh, that's not him. <laughs> and then I finally get to this one. Oh, hey, there he is. There you go. But my main problem is by making him the big bad, you diminish Michael. Exactly. Michael's a pawn now. He's a Darth Vader. <laughs> it's that problem that I had with Dark Knight Rises, where you have this whole film building up Bane, and then you get to the third act where you reveal Talia al Ghul, and Bane suddenly just becomes a henchman. That is very true as well. Yeah, I understand that. People have that issue. They're pretty much right, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, Michael, this has to be about Michael, and by just revealing that he's not even a henchman here, he's just a tool. Yeah. By revealing that he's just a tool, that really diminishes him. And I think a way that you could have saved that is have it be that, you know, because Wynn has been part of that asylum since the late 60s when Michael first did his killing of his sister. Right. He's been exposed to Michael and all stuff. What if this is a cult that's built around Michael as opposed to an old ancient cult that's just using him as a tool? That would be more interesting. Yeah, and it's like a cult and we can bring in that there's former people from past films that have encountered him. You could have brought Lindsay back from part four because you have Tommy and Lindsay. What if Lindsay's now a cult member and Tommy's the one trying to fight him, you know? Absolutely, yeah. But as you were saying with Dark Knight Rises for a second, this is kind of ahead of its time in this new way of storytelling that everything has to be interconnected. I mean, comics have been doing it for years by this point. Of course, of course, yeah. Going back to Roy, good old Roy Thomas. Absolutely. <laughs> but I think it's been a lot of this yearning in fandom is to make sense of these stories that weren't really yeah. connected because they were either different production teams, different writing teams, different producers, whatever, and they wanted that continuity. So now that's like everywhere and like Spectre. And, and again, I don't think that's a bad thing. Thing, but you still ultimately have to tell a good story. And if you're giving up a good story in favor of continuity. Yeah, it's definitely not inherently a bad thing if it's done well and skillfully. But a lot of the times, according to a lot of reviews and fans, it definitely is not. I get that. I get that fans love to dig themselves so deep into something that they surround themselves with it on all sides and try to put everything together. Yeah. That can result in some amazing things. For sure. But it can also result in some poor things. And that's where the thing about fans 
fan fiction and fan creations is it's not that any of them are good or bad. The ratio of what's good to bad is about the same as everything else. Yeah. It's just because something is exhibiting your fandom doesn't mean that it's right or that it's good. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've all been there. Like I've been yeah. there as well. I've tried to make sense of certain things and I've tried to come up with stories that would explain like weird logical inconsistencies in stories as well. <laughs> like they do it all the time in those old Star Wars expanded universe books. I mean, when we get to Halloween 8, try to remember to have me tell you my fanfic that I was going to do for Halloween 9. Sure, absolutely. And I was going to bring Busta Rhymes back. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, one of the things that I like about this story, which I want to tie, is the idea that Michael has kind of outlived himself and that it does need to be passed on to a new child. For sure, yeah. And we talked about this a bit in part 5, where how part 4 ended with that seemingly being passed on to Jamie, but then they never followed through on that. Nope. And this one, I like how they're setting up the kid of Danny, but there's so little focus on him. Yeah. They're focusing on the cult and the whole Strode household and all that stuff. They're not putting enough focus on Danny. Here you have an opportunity to explore how would a child be pulled right. to becoming what Michael became. And this one, it's just you have the stranger whispers things, kill him, kill him. <laughs> you know, you have him drawing doodles. You know, like I love that scene where there's the big fight in the kitchen and the dad just suddenly looks down and hears Danny holding a knife to him. Yeah, for sure. That's a good moment. And I wish they would build on that more. I wonder if that was because they realized that this kid is not the same caliber as actor as the kid who played Jamie in part five. Well, I mean, but again, if you're doing the Michael thing, you need a kid who's going to be cold. Yeah, that's true. But then you also want a kid who can emote because then you have that shift between the cold and the emotion, you know? Yeah. Humanity and the humanity. All I kept thinking of with the uh, kill him scenes was Summer of Sam with the dog. If they could have gotten that kid who played the lead boy in Village of the Damned. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. She was meant to be for me. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, Thomas Decker. It's one in a million for a really, really good child actor. Yeah, and honestly, I don't blame Daniel Harris for not wanting to come back for this. Oh, definitely not. I mean, look at what they did with Jamie. Oh, pretty gross. Given that Michael seems to react shock to, it's your baby too, Michael, I'm guessing they didn't actually have him fuck Jamie. I'm guessing they just did artificial insemination, but still impregnating someone against her will is a form of rape. Yeah, it's not a good... Uh, nothing about that is good. And again, if it had just been Jamie escapes and the entire story circles around Jamie as opposed to the baby. Yeah, but instead they had to kill her, then not kill her. Like, I thought she was dead and yeah. I thought they said she was dead. And then they're like, no, she's in the hospital and then kill her again. And I'm just like, geez, leave that kid alone. Yeah, if you're going to have her in the hospital, then have her come to have her rejoin in the third act. You already wasted the character of Rachel in part five. Don't waste Jamie. That's poor storytelling. It is. It was not only just gross and like poorly handled and unnecessary. <laughs> I mean, I love that one shot in the farm where, you know, she managed to ditch her baby. She's managed to get all this way. And Michael comes into the farm and she's just sitting there and she's not even running anymore. She's not fighting. She knows he's coming. And they don't even do a big thing. It's just as she looks at him, you hear the stab from off screen and then she falls to the ground. And yeah. even as he walks away, she just kind of weakly reaches for him and says, you can't have the baby, Michael. That was a good moment. It was. I don't understand why Michael didn't then double back. Yeah, Michael is not behaving well. No, it doesn't make a lot of sense, especially since he can zero in on anyone in his family or anyone tangentially related to the plot, like the shock jock. Like somehow he's in that van, even though he was across town like a few seconds ago. Can we just just cut the shock jock entirely from the movie. I would be happy with cutting the shock jock. He was awful. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he didn't even sound like a good shock jock. He was just kind of there. Yeah, exactly. You know, you need someone with that kind of Martin Downey, just constant shouty chewiness. Yeah, he sounded like he was a caller to a shock jock more than the shock jock himself. He sounded like you called an accountant's office. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this whole film to me was just off from the get-go. Like, they didn't even open with the theme, and I'm just like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. No memorable theme right there. What did you think of the score? I didn't really notice it too much. There was a couple times where it sounded more like the score to the thing, like it was aping the score to the thing than it was... It did have that up, dun, dun, dun. dun. Yeah. yeah. Because it seemed like more of a attempt at duplicating the score and not really having the inspiration behind that. I mean, my main problem with it, and again, this is Alan Howarth, who's been doing the scores since part two, and he was the main collaborator of Carpenter for a while. Right. It sounds like the score to part four again, where it's basic synth, 
in the mid 90s. Yeah. It's all just the regular themes we've all heard before. I was shocked that this was in the 90s. I kept thinking this was the 80s until I saw Power Ranger on that kid's desk and I'm like, yeah. "Oh my god." 1995. That's insane because it felt like 1985. <laughs> I will say again, one of the few things that I liked about part 5 was the director insisted that he do the score with real instruments. Right. And I thought it made all the difference and the score to part 5 is one of the few things I really like about that movie and he also did like this mad jumbo where the theme is kind of tumbling in on top of itself you know mm. playing on jamie's madness and all that stuff and here this is just kind of going right back to the old stuff right and it's just not interesting it's forgettable yeah i didn't really remember the score too much Let's talk about Marianne Hagen as Kara. She did fine. Yeah. I mean, she's like in a Rachel role. Yep. It's a pretty thankless role to balance that. You're kind of like the straight man in the horror film where you're just not really going to get to do any like outstanding character bits, like someone who's yeah. going to get murdered. You just have to be there, be present and be kind of engaging. And I think she did great with the material she was given. Yeah. It was funny because I read the script and there's been a lot of talk among the screenwriting community about how let's go back and read how female characters are introduced in scripts. And, you know, <laughs> like all these lines about how she's bookish, but she's hot. Absolutely. You know, she's the girl next door, but especially hot, you know, and all that stuff. It is all about fuckability, including this. It's like, she's a mom, but don't worry, she's going to yeah. get right into her underwear, guys. And the script straight up had a sequence where I'm just rolling my eyes, and it's like, and she stands in front of the mirror in her brawn panties, and we realize underneath the bookish exterior, she's actually quite hot. Absolutely. And it's very important for my enjoyment of this film. <laughs> and then in that scene, she's wearing her glasses, she's wearing the robe. I'm like, oh good, they cut that, they restate that and then she sets down the glasses and then she takes off the robe and she's like wearing a t-shirt and baggy pants it's like okay good they still changed it and then she takes off the t-shirt baggy pants she's standing there in a broad pants. <laughs> to look at herself in the mirror as you do not even to like brush your hair or anything just to look at yourself in the mirror it's like we already have the boob shot coming up later absolutely yeah. do we need that no we do not need that but that was the 90s you absolutely had to have an approachable girl so a she's definitely not a slut because she has glasses in her hair and a ponytail but don't worry she will take off those glasses she will yeah. let down that ponytail and she will take her clothes off but it's okay to like her and again i wanted more of the relationship between her and danny yeah that was confusing to me and how his turn is affecting that relationship yeah but we don't really get any of that because she's always pulling him away a lot of those scenes with him are happening while she's not around well this family seemed solely to be introduced to be cannon fodder essentially and before we get to the rest of the strodes though it's just i want more scenes between mother and son because that is such a key part of the story and even rachel and jamie in part four got those scenes to develop and build which is why part five was so disappointing that they threw that away yeah and here we don't even get that no it wasn't very well handled at all and i feel bad because she is a very good actress i thought she was pretty good in the part yeah but nothing to work with i felt the movie was basically in a race to get to more backstory than it was to actually have human interactions but and then to get onto the strode family who are just there for cannon fodder yeah there's a trap in slasher movies to make every person who's going to get killed as big of an asshole as we can so that we'll cheer when they die. Absolutely, yeah. You have to use that selectively because I think slasher films have much more effectiveness when you actually care about the person who's dying. It does and it doesn't as well. Like, I understand because people want something out of the slasher film where they're coming in basically like not right. as so much as a film but as like an experience and like a ride or whatever. Yeah. Because when you do care about those characters, then it <laughs> <laughs> if you're a human being, it feels bad. It feels really gross. But you have to juggle. You have to have highs and lows. I mean, the, the best films are not ones that ride a constant emotion. They're ones that constantly swing you around the whole emotional spectrum. For sure. Yeah, definitely. You know, so yeah, absolutely have characters like that. But does the dad need to be that much of an asshole? No, not at all. And also, you shouldn't be rooting for the death of another human being no matter what. So you can't get that pass that you really want where I want. obviously wanted that dad to get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, though, if we're going to do this story about this broken family, about this one guy who has such wounded pride... I think it's much more effective to have it be that, okay, he's finally coming around. His wife's call has gotten to him. He's coming back home. He's going to try to pick up the pieces. He's going to try to do what he can, only to now see his family slaughtered before him. 
and realize it's too late. He had nothing but contempt from the get-go. He was like a warden in Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> Even when he shows up in his final scene, he's like kicking the door and drunk going, where's dinner? And he's just like, she finally left as if he was proud. Like, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> and I like the mom, but again, she just didn't get much of a payoff. Yeah, she looked like my friend's mom from school. So I was just like, no. <laughs> and that's Kim Darby, who was a big child actor in the 60s. She was the girl in the original True Grit. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's cool. When I talked about the ineptitude of the film, her death was egregious with yeah. its, I can't get past this laundry. I can't navigate through this laundry. Yeah. I don't know what's happening. My glasses have shattered in mud. There was nothing really <laughs> clever about any of the kills or deaths. No, definitely not. And again, it's like, it would be interesting to build her up to a point where she's finally standing up against and defying her husband. For sure. But they don't really get you there? No, definitely not. She's like, I'm going to leave, but I want you to come with us. It felt flat. Yeah, it wasn't well handled at all. And then we get the brother, Tim, and his girlfriend, Beth. Yeah. I love this idea that they're like these kind of teen hipsters. Yeah. Who are trying to bring Halloween back to the town that bans Halloween, you know, going all footloose. Yeah, I like that they had an agenda. <laughs> yeah, I like that they're trying to build this thing, but then we never really get to see the thing that they're building except for in the background. Yeah. And then there's the creepy moment where the shock jock just starts hitting on his girlfriend on air. Right. And then they just go back home and fuck on his sister's bed. As you don't. <laughs> and it's, again, it's not building a story. It's just stuff happening happening, you're not putting the pieces together in a way that's telling a narrative. Yeah, it just seemed like it was a bunch of scenes strung together, and then yeah. Michael just happened to be there. Like, I don't understand why he's targeted certain people, or why he's even there. Like, I, if you try to follow his movements, it makes no sense. Yeah, and what I like about Tim is that he's kind of a reckless teenage guy, kind of a loser, kind of a slacker, but he's not a bad guy. Like, I actually like how he actually gets along with Danny really well, his little nephew. Yeah. He's always watch out for him when his dad starts hitting car he's like stop it he's trying to defend her i wanted more for that character than just oh i'm gonna fuck my girlfriend in my sister's room and then we get killed yep it's again like you need to actually build someone as a character if you want people to care that you're killing them off no that's absolutely true and these just feel like slasher tropes yep and again fandom yeah <laughs> We have to play the tropes because that's what the tropes mean because that's how the tropes should be done, you know? No. No, you actually have to tell a character story even if that character is not the main character. Yep. It just felt like that was boring to them. <laughs> yeah. So now we, we should get to the highlight of the movie who I thought gave the most hilarious performance. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's Paul Rudd. <laughs> As Tommy Doyle. Fresh off a uh, Super Nintendo commercial and now in his debut role. <laughs> well, and that's what I said. This was filmed first, but Clueless actually beat it to theaters by two months. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. And Clueless was a big breakout for him. Of course, yeah. And nobody cared about this. <laughs> And that's why I think, we'll see on the theatrical one, but I saw the credit set and introducing Paul Rudd. We'll see if that introducing credit stuck around by the time it finally came out. <laughs> For sure, yeah, absolutely. But he was just, the looks that he would give and the way that he would speak. I like to think, knowing him and seeing him in behind-the-scenes featurettes oh, and comedy cheap. films, yeah, that he knew what he was doing, so he was delivering it like an old-school horror, where it's like, and then I'm going to... <laughs> I mean, just that bit where he's rushing out of the hospital with the baby in his arms and Loomis is like, stop, don't go. And the way that he just turns and looks <laughs> in a kind of oddly, like, Igor fashion. Yeah, he was definitely having fun. Because, like, in between two films, like, it's night and day. Like, we know that he can do a great performance. So, yeah, obviously he was having a grand old time. <laughs> oh, this was a great performance. It just was not what I think the directors wanted from him. No, he was in, like, a universal horror film. <laughs> but I don't know. That made it all the better for me. Yeah, you can always tell when someone's going to be a breakout because, you like, the watchability of that person. You're like, what is this person doing? What are they up to? I laughed every scene he was in. And yeah. again, not through the intention of the filmmakers, but through the intention of him. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I like the idea of Tommy, too, that, you know, this kid from the first movie is now just kind of this obsessive conspiracy theorist. Yeah. He just is kind of planting himself across the street from that house because he knows if Michael ever comes back, he's going there. So I'm going to keep an eye out, especially on Halloween. Absolutely. I don't get how he knew so much about the cult of the thorns that he can actually build a magical circle of runes. <laughs> that got a bit much. Well, he had some sweet graphics on his computer, so he figured everything out. <laughs> yeah. And I, I got to say, the draft of the script that I read was pretty much what they shot here oh really <laughs> except for the circle of runes right probably they needed a way to get out of that situation yeah. to make some sort of tension or something the only things that were really added were the circle of runes and 
it's raining red, mommy, mommy, yeah. it's raining red. <laughs> yeah, that was oh, so poorly done. In the script, it was just they're on stage giving a presentation and the body drops down from up above, <laughs> you know, and the whole crowd screams and freaks out, you know. Even at super strength, that would take him so long to do. <laughs> And he'd be seen by so many people. Now, before we get on to Michael, though, anything else we want to say about Tommy? Thanks for being there, Tommy. You made the movie somewhat enjoyable for me. But I love how he just overplays how creepy he is. Oh, for sure. Every scene he's in, instead of having chemistry with Carr, it's like, maybe back her off a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And like his call into the radio station reminded me of like later Anthony Perkins and like the later um, Psycho films. They know I'm right. I'm always right. <laughs> And then just the way that Carr's friend is telling her about, oh, that's Tommy Doyle. He's creepy, but he's harmless. You have that him standing there in the window. Full <laughs> <laughs> Which would never play in. Like, even back then, they'd be like calling the police on that guy. He's harmless. He's looking like the dude from Carnival of Souls, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but bless Paul Rudd. Yep. For making it as watchably enjoyable as it is. His timeless vampire face will always be welcome in any film I watch him in. This is a film that I would love to see a gag reel because you just know there were so many moments that he followed up with a line. Oh, for sure. For sure. So let's talk about Michael. So now with Michael, they went back to George Wilbur, who was the stuntman who played Michael in part four. Okay. And I remember in part four, we had things to say about the way Michael was played. He's uh -huh. kind of big, kind of clunky. He doesn't really have any grace. He's kind of clumsy. I mean, at least here, they didn't have him try to walk across a roof. Yeah. I found, like, I didn't notice as much about his physicality because he was such a non-entity a lot of the times. Yeah. They don't really do much to play him up. I mean, like, there is one bit where, you know, he sticks the woman's head on the spike and he does the head from side to side. Yeah. But for the most part, Michael is obscured. He's off screen. He's in shadows. A lot of footwork, like, just focusing on his feet or him just walking into a room being like, okay. There wasn't that sort of chase element that a lot of Halloween films have yeah. or, like, the stock element it just seemed like people were just sitting there waiting to die or it's like he's behind me i'm gonna run ahead now he's in front of me he had the teleportation powers yeah exactly which it irritates me in the halloween films i accepted in the friday the 13th films even when like jamie's escaping and that nurse is helping her and then she's like yeah. i can't go with you i need to run back and i'm like why because she has to run back for so long yeah. you did not stop him at all it's cheap. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like they care. No tension. Zero tension. And again, it's an entire film about diminishing Michael. Yeah. So it's like, why should we care anymore if this is what he really is? Exactly. It's just a pawn. And again, half the creepy shots of someone looming in the shadows aren't even him. It's the mysterious stranger. Yep, that's true. The guy who was revealed to be Wynn. There were so many opportunities. There was like the nurse standing in the shadows and I'm like, just do the slowly emerging out of shadows. It's a classic bit. It never gets old. Just do it. Nope. And they do it, but they do it following the whole POV shot coming around the corner. Yeah. And then they also film it like he's just walking in a normal pace instead of like slowly just oozing out. Right. It was not done well. No. The mask I thought looked fine this time, given how much they struggled the last few. It didn't look like it was made out of Nerf materials. It didn't look great, but it didn't look awful. Yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> like they we're just like, oh, sure, I guess. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so here's a question for you. Uh-huh. Because we know they went in, they reshot. Again, there's 43 minutes of material from this cut that is not going to be in the theatrical cut because you're either going to use alternate takes or reshot material. Mm -hmm. If this was a movie that was given to you and you were told you can get maybe like a week's worth of reshoots... Here's maybe like half a million dollars. What would you change Ooh, to try to make it better? A very good question. Personally, to get people into the theater, I would just have like a standout scene. Like I'd have something for the trailer that would get people in there. If I only had that amount of time and that amount of money, I would put in like one standout, like Drew Barrymore and scream mm. kind of like show stopping moment, like front loaded with like something out of when a stranger calls something along those lines. That's what I do. Because I don't think the rest of the movie is salvageable. <laughs> I would definitely cut down the Strode family. I would try to build up more scenes between Kara and Danny. Yeah. I would try to alter the cult as much as I can so that it becomes a cult built around Michael instead of what it is. Mm -hmm. To try to make Michael still be the central figure of the cult. Right. I have it be that Wynn's desire to use Mike. You could just redo that scene between Wynn and Donald Pleasance in the office. That Wynn's desire for Michael is he sees power, power that he wants to control. And then the ultimate lesson of the film should be you can't control Michael. Yeah, I could see that. I just don't understand what they wanted and what they were getting out of this. Well, and then also we haven't talked about Loomis. I don't want to. <laughs> 
It's too sad. He was better than part five where he was screaming in a child's face and lurching around two sheets to the wind. Yeah, his health had declined so much. I like that bit where they hear on the radio, what happened to that old quack? Did he die? And then you just see an old Loomis turn around and go, no, just retired. Yeah. <laughs> He still got it, like you could tell. I almost wish if that had been his only scene in the movie, that would have been... <laughs> that would have been awesome. He doesn't have the energy anymore. Now, I thought he died during production. Okay, what happened is they made this cut. Right. Then he went in for heart surgery and died during heart surgery. Okay, so he had filmed shooting this cut. He had filmed this, but then he wasn't available for any of the reshoots. Okay, that makes sense. In terms of like, if you reshot that scene between him and Wynn in the office, you would just reshoot Wynn. Right. And just play off whatever material you have from him. That's true, yeah. And that's why I know the ending, because they do change the ending in the theatrical cut. That much I remember. Yeah. I don't remember what they do, but I remember that they changed it. So I know part of that was complicated by the fact that they didn't have him around to finish that. I believe that they just don't do anything. I think he goes in to confront Michael and you just hear a scream from off camera, if I remember correctly. And here you have this weird thing where Wynn passes on the symbol of the thorn to him. Yeah. What is that? That means that your whole organization is founded on very silly principles because now you're passing it on to someone who does not want to further your agenda. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know that they cut that, but yeah. I think they were just trying to go for thematically linking Loomis to Michael. Again, yeah, it's trying to overthink connections. Exactly. Yeah, you know, we always have to have Loomis tied to Michael. Well, no, you don't. Tommy can be your new Loomis. Yeah. You can pass down the torch to Tommy, despite the fact that Friday the 13th had a Tommy. Right. Who was basically that series Tommy. You can have a torch being passed, just pass it down to Tommy. Right. And then Tommy is now going to have to keep struggling with helping Danny to not become the new Michael. You could almost then have that be the plot of a part seven if they hadn't gone with what they thankfully did with H2O, is right. have it be that Danny is still being pulled to that side. You know, you still have that baby around who's now growing up and might also be potentially pulled to that side, trying to prevent that as the specter of Michael is still looming out there. Or he becomes a Michael Myers, and then their old Michael Myers comes back, and then it's two Michael Myers against each other. In order to thwart <laughs> my enemy, I must become him. Exactly. Or the old Michael Myers has to come back in action to stop the new Michael Myers, <laughs> and it becomes a Godzilla movie. I'm just imagining a shuffling old Loomis. Yeah. In the Michael Myers mask. Trying to oh. lurch after people with a butcher's knife. Oh, God. That's so depressing. And I'll speak only evil in order to thwart evil. <laughs> Your impression is good. At least in this film, there was never one bit where Loomis introduced himself in a scene by flopping on someone from out of the shadows and going, evil! Yeah, it's true. You know what? It's a testament to Donald Pleasance's yes. abilities that he's in this serious decline in age and health, and he's still very watchable on screen. And I love how they completely got around all the burn scarring with just like, oh, plastic surgery. Yeah, they could do uh, wonders. No, I don't scare children. <laughs> And it's like, why would you want to bring him back as a doctor when part five showed what he's like as a doctor? Yeah. <laughs> he was horrible in part I five. I know. I guess it makes sense that they were trying to get him in basically because they had an evil agenda. But yeah, <laughs> he should have been fired a long time ago. Probably after the events of part one. Well, I'm also like just imagining like Loomis going up to Jamie and going, Jamie, it's me, Loomis. And her being like, no, get him away from me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm more traumatized by you than Michael. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a film where I will give it some points for trying. I mean, I like that it had a point of view. I just didn't like its point of view. <laughs> but the execution is just not good. No. Again, I still think it's nowhere near as bad as five. But I think its cardinal sin is twofold. Two things that it does that it absolutely should not have done. One, waste Jamie. And two, devalue Michael. Right. That's true. Those are two absolute, you kind of can't move on from that. Yeah. Normally, I would agree that this was better than five because I usually reward something that's trying instead of not trying like five was. But I just hated this movie so much. I was just so weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in this one, it wasn't as over the top awful as part five. <laughs> Like, part five's entire cinematography shtick was, let's shove a handheld camera in people's faces as they scream at the top of their lungs. Yeah, that's true. I'll just say, I, I don't like 
five or six. The way that Ferrans described it was he was trying to bridge the original two films with parts four and five. And it's like, you didn't really need to because part four already had that bridge. Yeah. Part four was already a throwback film while also going a new direction. Part five was awful, but you didn't need to go as far as you did. You know, it's true. And again, the whole Cult of the Thorn thing is not as cool as you think it is. It is definitely not. Yeah. I don't think you're getting from that what you wanted to get from that. Because again, you're taking it away from Michael. Absolutely. And you don't recover from that. Yeah. It's sort of like thematically your ideas have now eclipsed what makes it special. Well, I mean, it's like we ran into that with Nightmare on Elm Street with like part six where it was, it's really these Kandarian dream demons (laughs) that are just using Freddy. And then like Wes Craven's new nightmare. It's not really Freddy. It's a demon trying to break into our reality in the image of Freddy. It's midichlorians. It's midichlorians. Yeah. I don't think Friday the... Th- well, I can't remember what the hell happened in Jason Goes to Hell. That was a weird plot with the I whole heart. I don't think heart. it ever really tried to, like, bring it all back together. I think, well, they tried to do, like, Jason keeps surviving because he's actually jumping into different bodies by people eating the heart. Oh, right, yeah. He was quantum leaping. <laughs> and there was some kind of, like, an ancient dagger or something. I don't remember. It's a very bad movie. Very bad. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one being very bad. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah, we'll do that one next year. No. <laughs> yeah. Yay! <laughs> Halloween 6 is just... Just, again, they don't know where to go. No. And I think that they made the right choice in not continuing on with the storyline. Yeah. <laughs> what a dig, though, to this guy who's just like, I've done it. I've made my shared universe of Halloween. It all connected. And then they're like, yeah, yeah. It never happened. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, there's nothing in H2O that doesn't say that it happened. And in fact, they did have references to Jamie that were cut out. Oh, did they? They just don't bring any of it up. Okay. Well, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I, I don't remember how that went. We'll get there next time because I have like early scripts and stuff for that. For sure. What are you hoping for from the theatrical cut, Alex? Watchability, basically. I don't think I'm going to get anything that I really enjoy out of it, but I just want something that's less frustrating. Yeah, there's not much you can move around with what you have here. Yeah, I just want something that has something interesting happening. (laughs) It's not too much to ask. Will we hopefully get more takes of Paul Rudd being weird? From what I remember, I think we do get a bit more Paul Rudd, so that's what I'm hoping for. What I'm hoping is that they don't use alternate takes where he didn't go as far. I remember there being, like, a couple joke takes, like, they left in some of his ad libs, if I'm not mistaken. Like, I think he, like, when he runs past a security station, he's like, oh, great security or something like that. (laughs) I want more of that, yes. Yeah, so hopefully that is the case and not just me misremembering. Oh, blessed Rudd. (laughs) This version, I'm just going through my notes right now, does have one of the worst scream fakeouts I've ever seen, where it's just, like, someone half-heartedly going, yeah! And then her going like, what was that? Uh, whatever. <laughs> oh, the one where it's just the people making out on the table? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> couple other notes. Uh, felt really bad for the baby actor. Also, I cannot believe that there's no morning cleaner for that bus station because there's blood everywhere. And then there's a baby <laughs> yeah. just in a drawer that no one has noticed. Yeah, I'm like, he looks down and sees this puddle of blood with a trail. And it's like, nobody else noticed that. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people, when they walk around in public, look down because they don't want to look at other people. Yeah. They're going to notice that. Absolutely. Because they didn't have smartphones yet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and then the baby was just quiet the entire time. Yeah. I think in the original script, the baby was actually put in the trash. Oh, yeah? Like under the trash bag. I see. But still, being a father of two... That would suffocate it. Yeah, exactly. That baby will need to eat or be changed within like an hour. (laughs) Because I don't remember many public bathrooms just having a cabinet there where you can go in for extra paper towels. I've seen it in a couple places, but not in like a public place like that not in a bus yeah, station they usually have a supply closet that yeah. is locked if you're gonna have an open drawer like that in a bus station bad things are gonna happen <laughs> yeah I do like the lines of, is she a ghost? Was Michael a ghost? (laughs) That was like the one moment where you saw some fire from Loomis. Exactly. And I wanted the last line to be, did a ghost stab a ghost? (laughs) And then the script I know had more of the sheriff. So there was more back and forth between Loomis and the sheriff, but never went anywhere. It was just they keep yelling at each other. Which is what you need. You need the Loomis to play off the sheriff. You need the straight man and the crazy man. Now, the script also had an additional bit to the end that is not in here. Where it's, you know, Loomis goes back in, sees the body of Michael, pulls off the mask, and it's Dr. Wynn. Okay. And then Michael, we had seen gone off with the duster and the fedora and all that stuff. And then there's another scene where Tommy, Kara, Danny, and the baby go back to the bus depot because it's nearby. Right. And she goes in the bathroom with Danny just to clean up and all that stuff. And Tommy's out there with the baby cooing it and all that stuff. And he hears a scream and he goes in. 
And here's Danny, cold-faced like little child Michael Myers, standing over his mother who's throaty cut. Uh. Cut to black. <laughs> Great. So again, it's like, you did that with Halloween 4. Come on. Yep. I'm glad they cut that. Yeah, for sure. Danny didn't quite deserve that ending, and I would have loved to see more build-up to the ending they did get. And they could have gone into that if they had continued on with the story and then maybe made something interesting, but whatever. So, but anyways, we need to still come back here. I think we're done talking about Halloween 6, and yet we're going to talk more about Halloween 6. That's pretty much, yeah, the franchise in a nutshell. <laughs> we'll be back in a beep for the theatrical cut. Yay! Of Halloween, <laughs> The Curse of Michael Myers. Our curse. Welcome back to the Barry Sim Show. We're recording live from Haddonfield with part two of Halloween Six coverage. The pro- not the producer's cut, <laughs> the uh, theatrical cut. All right, we're going straight up theatrical with this bastard. Yes, we are. The one that was released. Yeah, this one was interesting. It sure was. I'm glad we did decide to split this episode up because while the first hour of the movie is mostly the same with a few little differences, we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. Man, did they change that third act? They sure did, but for the better or for the worst, we'll discuss. Yeah. Well, I, why don't we just go ahead and just jump into it? And Alex, do you recommend the theatrical cut? No, still don't recommend the theatrical cut. Still not a good movie, but I actually liked this version better. It made a lot less sense, but was more watchable, if that makes sense. That's actually exactly what I was going to say, too. <laughs> yeah, they definitely made it more interesting, added a bit more tension, a little bit more kills, more in line with horror films, more than the uh, low-budget thriller of the first cut, where Michael was more prominent. And I remember we discussed your issue with Michael being more of a pawn, and then this way mm-hmm. he kind of gets his groove back a little bit yeah they did um well let me just go ahead and say that again it's not a great movie but i did enjoy this one too more it makes less sense but in a better way mm-hmm. and i think yeah we should just go ahead and talk about that of one of the big things that i hope they would change was that they kind of diminished michael by making him second fiddle to the cult of the thorn one of the big things i love about this re-edit is they redid the cult of the thorn to be built around michael mm-hmm or it was they're an already old cult who like found Michael and latched onto him and are trying to get his power from him instead of him just being a tool. Yeah. And of course it blows up in their face. I thought that made for a much stronger story. Mm-hmm. And we'll again get into more of the differences, but what do you think of that element? Uh, I preferred it, obviously. Michael's the star of the show. We're not really here for the Cult of the Thorn Part 6. So yeah, I'm definitely down with that. I'm glad they even had a character straight up tell them to put the robes away. Yeah, <laughs> it's not Halloween anymore. <laughs> Why don't we just kind of work up through the changes in like the first hour of the movie. Most prominently, we have three kills that were changed. The first one was the truck driver who now has his entire head snapped off. Yeah. Which I gotta say, it reminded me a lot of, you know, the kind of random gore effects in part four, Mm -hmm. where I found out it was by the same guy, John Carl Butler. Oh, I see. I kind of always like that idea of Michael can just straight up kill you with his bare hands. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) And I like that head one because it's just so quick and sudden. And it reminded me of that bit in part four where he reaches into the truck and just rips the guy's face off. Yeah, I like that as well. They actually um, speed up a lot of elements at the beginning, Mm -hmm. which I normally it's viewed as like uh, typical Hollywood can't let scenes just breathe. And I'm like, no, speed it up even faster. Yeah, I noticed there were some cuts. Yeah. Like Kara goes straight to the bra and panties. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. She's just like, all right, let's do it. This. The one cut I kind of didn't like was they did cut down a lot of the Loomis stuff, like a lot of Loomis and Dr. Wynn, mm-hmm. especially the stuff just setting up the character of Dr. Wynn, because now he just pops up now and then without much explanation. Right. Yeah. No, that's true. And I wish that they had maybe just explained that one a little bit more. Yeah. I don't know what went into their decision making process, but they probably felt it dragged a bit, which it did, but it also takes away from the story. And <laughs> I don't know. It's just not a good movie either way. <laughs> I think Dr. Wynn is a character that you need to keep his opening establishment stuff. Yeah, for the payoff, absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm glad that they changed parts of the payoff, but he's still a character that you need to kind of explain a bit more. Mm-hmm. And I like the way that his explanation came in. Like, he's retiring and he wants Loomis to take over. Now it's just he comes back and he wants to hire Loomis back. Yeah, for reasons that will never be clear to me. <laughs> Well, and then we should talk about the death of Jamie, because instead of getting stabbed in the farmhouse and going to the hospital, you're, she's thrown on the farm equipment. Yeah. You know, there's the whole long stalking scene. 
What did you think of that sequence? I don't know which one was worse. I don't like the fact that she was shot in the head while trying to recover in a hospital or this really drawn out horribleness. I, I, I disliked both immensely. <laughs> I like that it kept escalating, though. That kind of was funny to me, where it's just like, she's reaching out to him, and then he just turns the machine on. I'm just like, I guess I maybe kind of appreciate that. If they're going to unceremoniously kill off a major character from previous installments, might as well make it stupid and ridiculous. Yeah, it, I don't think you needed to go quite as gory with the blades and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But, okay, killing off Jamie's stupid idea. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to do it, at least I thought this was a bit more effective. Yeah. I did like the bit where she reaches out to him and he reaches out to her and then pushes her down. Yeah. That's what I kind of like. It's not as sad and sullen. It's a more horror movie. Yeah. I mean, I will say the main problem I have with the producer's cut, and we'll get into this more, is that it was just kind of a bland thriller. Mm-hmm. This one, it's at least a more effective visceral horror movie. Yeah, it's doing its job. Like, this is what it's there for. They even brought in, like, a different cinematographer and editor for this one. Even the way that it's shot has more impact. It's more mm-hmm. visceral. It's more juicy and striking. Yep, for sure. Sure. Again, we'll definitely get into that more with the climax. I'm trying to think. The only other major addition I could think of before then was killing the father. They redid how he stabbed him onto the fuse box and here he like all puffs up and his head blows up and all that. <laughs> yeah, they can keep killing that guy. I hate that guy. <laughs> I think it lingered longer than it needed to, but I thought it was more effectively shot. Like I think in the other one, it was just he picked him up by the neck and then stabbed him onto the fuse box. And this right. one, I like that he picks him up with a knife. Yeah, yeah. But then you cut to the outside of the house as you're pulling away from the house and the lights flicker. You should have just cut away there instead of let's go back in and watch his head blow up. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's very true. And other than that, I can't think of many other changes that were made. I will say the score, Alan Howarth did still redo parts of the score for this movie, mm-hmm. but then they brought in Paul Rab Johns, who's a music editor and remixer who went in and added extra sounds and kind of reprocessed it. Mm -hmm. There are some differences, but otherwise the first hour is still largely the same movie. For the opening credits, I like that they did that descending character names where it just keeps getting Mm. lower. It is no longer introducing Paul Rudd. It's introducing Paul Stephen Rudd. Yeah, what was that? I don't know. (laughs) And again, it was untrue because Clueless came out first. Exactly. Paul Stephen Rudd. Let me just check and see if he ever used the Paul Stephen Rudd on anything. I can't imagine, no. I don't know if that was like a person saying like, Paul Rudd, that doesn't sound very interesting. You're certainly never going to play Ant-Man in your future. Okay, yeah, he used that name on a TV series called The Fire Next Time. Okay. On a TV series called The Wild Oats. Uh Uh-huh. A TV series called Rebel Highway. He did a lot of TV shows before he got on here. Were they all like pilots? Most of them were one season. Okay. And a TV series called Sisters. But Halloween is the last one that he used Paul Stephen Rudd on. Okay. In an early short film, A Question of Ethics, he went by the name Kenny Chin. Interesting. (laughs) <laughs> Anyways, there was a commentary track by the screenwriter, Daniel Ferrand. Mm-hmm. It was kind of expected where, you know, a lot of his criticisms were, well, they didn't stay true to my vision because mm-hmm. he had no involvement in any of the reshoots. Okay. But what's interesting is he did reveal a couple of things from earlier drafts that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. One of them was that instead of the shock jock, it was supposed to be Tommy was the host of a pirate conspiracy theory radio show. Okay. Yeah. I don't mind that. And he was intentionally meant to be the next Loomis. They were specifically grooming him to take over the Loomis role because they knew this was going to be Donald Pleasance's last. That's very fitting. Of course, he swore off ever appearing in another one after that. (laughs) (laughs) He made the right choice. (laughs) They were going to bring back the little girl, Lindsay, now grown up as his girlfriend. But I think Tommy kind of works better as a loner. Yeah, for sure. Especially if he's going to be like this weirdo pirate radio guy. I think it makes a lot more sense if he's just this angry loner who's still scared of the boogeyman, quote unquote. And then Jamie, instead of getting shot in the hospital like she was in the producer's cut, the other heroes were going to go and free her from the hospital, and then she was going to be the one who would lead them through the tunnels in the third act. Okay. And she was still going to die, but she was going to die in a big final showdown with Michael. I would have preferred that. Yeah, it's still not the best. No, yeah. At least a hero's ending for the character. Well, and again, you know, we're going to kind of get elements of that in H2O, so it'll be interesting. That's true. 
that's like all I have on like the major. I actually I found another draft of the script that's even earlier, mm-hmm. but I found it last night, so I have a chance to. Oh, uh, I see. Maybe you can uh, genocrify that or something. Even just skimming that, it's mostly the producer's cut, and even the screenwriter is like the producer's cut is still a weak adaptation of my vision, but it's better than the theatrical. I see. And I got to say, the special features on the Blu-ray, it's the only one of the set that doesn't have a making of documentary because they only got like a handful of interviews. The director didn't want to come back for an interview. Only two of the actors came back for an interview. (sighs) Which two? Beth, who was the girlfriend who gets killed. Good for you, Beth. Very professional. And then the one who took over Daniel Harris's role. Okay. Who is actually a close friend of Daniel Harris, and Daniel Harris has never borne her any grudge. That's good. Yeah, she's just doing her job. But it's interesting that they can't put together like a comprehensive making of on this movie because no one wants to talk about it. Yeah, I can understand that. And a lot of the struggles seem to be it was the Weinsteins, after one test screening, insisted on all the changes that were made. Well, normally uh, they don't exactly have a great track record, but I do agree with them on this one. Yeah, I actually do too. And it's interesting how so many people are bitter about all the changes that were made for the theatrical. That's why I'm kind of glad we watched the producers first and then the theatrical. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's so many people who watch the theatrical and then go back to the producers. Because yeah, the producers makes more sense and explains things, but I don't think it's a stronger story. No, I think they made a miscalculation making that a slow burn. Well, why don't we go ahead and just move on to that third act that they did where they throw out a lot of the cult of the thorn. Instead, there's more of a science angle. They kind of just suggest a lot of stuff. There's a lot of visceral horror with red lit tunnels and stuff. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the third act in this one? I caught my attention because I was just like totally zoning out when I was rewatching it because of the similarities with the producer's cut for most of the film. So I'm just like, oh, why am I doing this? I'm reliving the nightmare. And then when this started kicked in, I'm just like, oh, okay, now something is actually happening. Now things are moving and uh, frantic pace. It doesn't make any sense. It signifies very little. But I did have a lot of questions, especially when they pass by all like the science experiment and like the vials and stuff like that. I'm just like, is this setting up for future installments? Is this doing what they did with part five with the shadowy man where like they didn't know what they were doing, but like here's some possible other things that could be going on with the Halloween franchise or setting it up for space or something? (laughs) Well, and I I actually like that that kind of goes back to the Carpenter element of suggest a lot of possibilities, but don't give anyone a clear answer. Yeah, because the answer is never going to be satisfying. Yeah, because the Cult of the Thorn was not satisfying. No, for sure. Because it made Michael into just a tool. In this one, I love that. Did this science create Michael? Is this science just trying to recreate Michael? Are they just trying to tap into what makes Michael Michael Mm -hmm. and pass it on to new babies? I kind of like that they add that X-Files science element to it. For sure. As long as you don't think about it too much, because I'm like, what are you... Like, the whole weaponizing a destructive force is a very popular theme with a lot of science fiction and horror films, and it just never makes sense to me why they're doing something so unpredictable. (laughs) Well, and that's why I'm glad it wasn't like a military or a corporation. It was a cult. They were still a cult. Where it was like the Halloween project and it's got like H period A period L. (laughs) It stands for like humanized assassin. We find out that the shape is an acronym. Exactly. (laughs) I like it because... Michael is someone you can't easily explain, but at least this gives you enough suggestions to explain what the cult is doing in terms of they didn't create Michael. Mm -hmm. This was something that we talked about last week was you could take that scene where Wynn and Loomis are talking in the office and just reshoot all the Wynn stuff and just reuse the Loomis footage. That's exactly what they did. Yep, for sure. They completely changed it to they found Michael and wanted to tap into Michael. Mm -hmm. And they are, yes, they're an ancient cult in society, but Michael is not a part of that. That is just something that they saw and were drawn to. Which is better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I'll give them this, the fetuses in the jars were better than the ones in Village of the Damned. (laughs) Yes, they were. Yeah, even like, what is in those syringes? Who knows? Why did it make Michael bleed green? Who knows? It's the secret of the ooze. And that is all stuff that, yeah, you could play up with. I actually don't mind it when people do that of let's just throw stuff in for the next person to pick up on. Mm-hmm. I kind of actually like it when comic books do that, too, of when someone's ending their run. Let me throw a bunch of stuff in there and see what the next person does. <laughs> as long as the other person's cool with it. I thought it was so much better shot and edited. Yep. And so much more kind of in your face and visceral. I love the flash editing. Mm-hmm. There was a lot more like they actually had jump scares in this particular version, which they didn't really before. So it was done well. And even like all the stuff that they would dwell on with the girl or whatever, the yeah. voice or something, it was just flashes making them connected. At a certain point later, they kept flashing to Jamie, which I'm not sure exactly what they were going for, but it kind of brought everything full circle. Yeah. And I did actually even like that moment where 
where Michael's on the ground and Paul Rudd is about to leave. And then he's like, no, let me go hit him a few more times. And it's just this flash montage of him beating Michael's head. In. Yeah. And I've been asking people to do that in horror films forever. And finally yeah. someone does it. And it was Paul Rudd. And also kudos for amping up the Paul Rudd. Oh, I love his intensity in this third act. Yeah. I mean, there's especially that sequence where he's trying to break down the door with a fire extinguisher and Michael's coming. Yeah. And he's just almost losing it. Yeah. He almost completely abandons it. Like it's that moment where he's like, maybe I'm going to run, but he's also sort of hysterical, but then he keeps going. He's kind of laughing, but yeah. terrified. No, it's good with proper direction. They brought out a lot more of him because he was, I still liked what he was doing in the original cut, like you were saying with the uh, campy, leering looks that he was giving. But in this version, they brought out a completely different side of him and it was also effective. Yeah, it's just, I think my only main issue with the stuff they had in the third act is that it's so jarringly different from everything in the first hour. It very much is. That it does feel like a completely different movie. It was like suddenly an action film, which it wouldn't have felt like that if it wasn't so tonally different. It was like a shot of adrenaline. They also brought in someone new to play Michael for all the reshot stuff. Oh, yeah? What do you think of Michael and all the new stuff? I liked him because he wasn't super fast. He kind of glided in and out, which I liked. He was a bit more fluid, which is the Michael that I liked before. He's not supposed to be Jason. He had a fast walk, though, yeah. Yeah, but his lunges when he's like, I can't get you, didn't seem as awkward. And he did get to grab her a couple times, which was good. I, I liked it. I liked it. I thought he did a good job. Yeah, and that's where, again, on the extra features, they were complaining because they replaced the original guy, who was George Wilbur, who played him in part four, remember walking across the roof. Mm -hmm. And they were complaining that, oh, they got someone who wasn't as big. And it's like, Michael isn't about being big. Michael's a panther. Yeah. You want someone who has some kind of grace and finesse to him. And that's what I thought the new guy actually brought. Exactly. I mean, like, I love bits. Like in that fire extinguisher scene where he steps out of the door and just looks over at Tommy and just keeps looking at him. Mm -hmm. And then starts saying towards him. Or the bit where he just kind of walks over and gets the surgical knife. Yeah, for sure. Or that bit where he's charging down the, the red lit hallway. Yeah. That was so beautiful. That is, I want a gif of that. <laughs> that is like a perfect Michael Myers shot. Was that just a random cult of the doctor at the end or was that somebody else who was killed at the end oh uh, it's funny that's another stuntman who's actually the father of the guy playing michael oh interesting <laughs> so that's just kind of why they did that <laughs> uh, i see that's funny and i will say the blu-ray does have a couple of cut bits where there were extra gore shots that were cut to keep from getting an nc-17 so you like see the guy's face getting shoved through the bars uh, yeah that's what i thought they was gonna go for what did you think about what they did with lois <laughs> I guess it was the best of a worse situation. Like, we got nothing left here. <laughs> yeah, I think they should have just talked to him and that's it. I don't think they should have had, like, the thriller scream at the end, especially since they knew he probably wouldn't be coming back. Like, I guess they were trying to kill him off or something, but still. Well, you know what you could have done? You had that bit where in the producer's cut, he walked over and looked down at the figure in the hallway. Mm -hmm. You could have the shots where he walks over and looks down at something and then have it be that what he's looking down at is the mask and the syringe. Yeah. And then just cut to that shot from the producer's cut of Michael walking away wearing the trench coat and hat. Mm-hmm. I guess it's sort of fitting in a sense. It is a horror film. It's just uh, depressing when it's just like, yeah! In memory of Donald Pleasance. Thanks. That's my only major problems with the re-edit. The whole just kind of weird cop out on doing anything with the Donald Pleasance character. Mm -hmm. Maybe just don't even have him at the end anymore. I know it's kind of not a fitting note for him to go on, but like if they didn't have the footage, just don't even try to fake it. Yeah, I mean, you, there's other stuff you could have done with doubles or makeup effects and stuff. Mm -hmm. Just to try to explain what happened to him. Right. Well, even just that bit where he walks over, looks down, and he sees the mask, that would be a great echo of the first movie where, you know, he looks out the window and Michael's gone. Yeah, for sure. Especially since in the end, it doesn't even matter because he dies of natural causes in the franchise with the next installment. I think... I don't remember. I, I'm trying to because I know that his nurse is in the first act. Well, we'll find out soon enough. <laughs> yeah, we will. I mean, I guess it's all sort of vague anyways. Yeah, it is what it is. Like, unfortunately, he passed away and that's a damn shame. And then my other thing was that they kind of never really resolved Danny and Danny's draw to the dark side. Yeah, I mean, I kind of appreciate it because the actor just was not bringing it and it wasn't really right. done effectively in the first place. But it's sort of a missed opportunity because they do show the flashes of it. Right. I don't know if you could have involved him in, the, in an alternate ending. I don't know. Him doing something to Loomis. I don't know. 
They should have pulled the classic, like, they're driving off and he's just sitting in the back looking like a weirdo. And, and he pulls out the long knife. Yeah, something like that. And that's it. And you just cut the black. Yeah, something like that would have been better, especially since they left in enough breadcrumbs for his character that they would have to sort of resolve it somewhat or at least give, like, a to-be-continued sort of vibe. Yeah. So, I mean, I also do get where people criticize this movie in terms of it doesn't quite make sense. It sets up a lot of things it doesn't resolve. Oh, for sure. No, I think neither of them are very good movies, but no. I appreciate that this one was at least shorter yeah <laughs> yeah i just appreciate that this one at least had something to watch that interested me because what they were doing should have worked out a lot better because their heads were in the right place but it just wasn't well executed yeah i think the producer's cut is a case where it's a lot of interesting stuff on paper that doesn't quite play off on screen well no whereas the theatrical cut is the stuff that they added is stuff that on paper looks just silly and ridiculous, but man, is it effectively executed. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's just, it's visceral. It's a horror movie. Yep. And I know on the, on the bonus features about the producers got, they were like, but we wanted to try to go back to the basics of make it a thriller, a supernatural thriller. And it's like, that's fine, but you made a boring one. Yeah, you did. You didn't do a very good job. And this one, yeah, redirected as a horror, but at least it was more effective. And again, I just want to say that third act is more effective because the first hour is still the exact same movie. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts from you on that? No, I think we pretty much covered it. Paul Rudd is great. I think everyone did a good job effectively in the reshoots and everything. Like even the actress, I can't remember her name, that played the quote unquote main character. She was bringing it too. So Marianne Hagen. She did a great job too. In terms of this film being reshot and re-edited, what's interesting is that it ran parallel to Dimension also doing the exact same thing with Hellraiser 4 Bloodline. Okay. I don't think I ever saw that one. I stopped after 3. 4 I actually kind of like. And what's interesting is they actually brought in Joe Chappelle to do some uncredited reshoots on it. Oh, interesting. Oh, in terms of how there was that six-year gap, mm -hmm. what happened was the franchise rights had lapsed. Okay. And it started a bidding war in terms of who could buy up those rights. While Dimension ultimately triumphed, what happened was John Carpenter was trying to buy back the rights himself with the backing of New Line. Oh, that would have been good. So this could have gone back to New Line with John Carpenter producing them. Mm-hmm. I think, doesn't he have them now, like after all is said and done? No. No, he still doesn't? Okay. The Akkads, I think, are still involved. And it's the son is in control now? Malak Akkad, yeah, because Mustafa's passed away. Yeah, he was like killed in a something, wasn't he? Yep, I'm going to bring that up when we get to part eight, because that was his last one. Okay. Yeah, it was a terrorist bombing. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It's horrible. And actually, to his credit, Malik Akkad is one of the few people who actually came in and did an interview for the Blu-ray. <laughs> I would, even if I didn't like the film, I would come in. Yeah. Just, I think it's professional if you're doing that sort of thing. I would never say no if I was involved in a production, unless it was like morally reprehensible. The feeling I get is that regardless of which cut you prefer, they're both compromised due to the same thing in that it was a too many cooks in the kitchen thing where you had all these people in charge who wanted different things. Yeah. Because the Akkads wanted one movie, the writer wanted one movie, the director wanted one movie, the Weinsteins wanted one one movie, Paul Freeman, who was the other producer, wanted another movie, and they were trying to make a movie that was all of them. Mm -hmm. Everyone seems to agree that that was just the main problem, is that nobody just stepped back and said, make the movie. Yeah, I could see that, for sure. Even as they were making it, changes were being made, pages were being thrown out. Oh, and then one other little tidbit is I found out that the first director who was attached to this film back when Ferran started working on his draft was actually Fred Walton, who is best remembered for these slasher films, When a Stranger Calls, uh, on April Fool's Day. Nice. <laughs> and that's actually why they added that scene where Kara calls up Beth and is like talking to her. There's someone in the room behind you. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, nice. Other than those movies, he mostly did TV movies, but those include the thrillers I Saw What You Did, The Stepford Husbands and when a stranger calls back. <laughs> so it would have been interesting. It was somewhere during the script development that he left and Joe Chappelle came in. Okay. And Joe Chappelle apparently only agreed to do this as part of a three-film contract that he had with the wine scenes. Oh, man. Which also included Phantoms. <laughs> <laughs> of course. The classic. So let me just wrap up with the box office release. Halloween 6 was released on September 29th, 1995. It opened at number two behind the second week of Seven which I remember being a very unexpected sleeper hit at the time. Yeah, Seven was big in my high school. Everyone was always like, you seen Seven? Have you seen Seven? I know it was a film that nobody expected to be big, but then it like suddenly did really well. Yeah, word of mouth, I think, on that one. And then the following week, Seven was still number one, with the debuts of Assassins, Dead Presidents, and How to Make an American Quilt dropping Halloween to number eight. Wow, that was a time and a place. <laughs> that brings me back. Yep. And then in its third week, Jade and the Scarlet Letter debuted. Oh my god. 
but Halloween still held the number eight slot. Oh, good for them. And then by the fourth week, Get Shorty, Now and Again, and Mall Rats opened. Oh, wow. <laughs> and Halloween disappeared from the listings. There you go. Horror movies can usually hold on. Like, I worked in yeah. movie theaters for like seven years, and my God, even the worst horror remake can pack the kids in. I'm surprised that they released it on September 29th instead of the end of October, because I, I even looked ahead a little further, and it wouldn't have had a huge amount of competition, because what came out at the end of October were Powder, Vampire in Brooklyn, and Copycat. Jeez. Like, so many people do not release horror films around Halloween, and I'm just like, why? Why wouldn't you? That's the weekend that everyone's charged up for it. Or maybe they think everyone's partying or something, that no one's actually going to go to the movies. Yeah, and I even looked, like, a few weeks after Halloween, and there wasn't anything huge until, like, in the mid-November, GoldenEye and Toy Story came out. Right. But, I mean, still, that gives you a good few weeks if you had come out on a Halloween release, and it's like, I doubt Vampire in Brooklyn was going to beat Halloween 6. No, for sure. So, anyways, it ultimately pulled a domestic gross of just over $15 million against a budget of five. So, kind of typical for what a slasher film does. Yeah. And it was enough that they did quickly greenlight the next film for a couple of years. What is it like? This was 95, you said? This one was 95, and I want to say it was 98 when H2O came out. Yeah, it had to be 97 or 98, because it would have been just after Scream. Yeah, which I did look. It was 96. It is interesting kind of seeing like early signs of the Dimension slasher film style in this movie in terms of like the editing and the music and stuff. Yeah. H2O was 98. 98? Okay, that makes sense because I saw it in the theater and I only snuck into one rated R movie in my life, which was Scream. I saw Halloween in theaters too, or H2O in theaters too, so. Nice. That's the only one I have. I saw Halloween 8 in theaters as well and that was Ooh. an experience. <laughs> Yeah, we'll definitely get into that more when we get to those. For sure. Any final thoughts on the entire broader Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers experience? I will never watch this movie again. It was interesting to examine it this diligently, but that is my last time with Halloween 6. Goodbye, Michael, and goodbye, Jamie. You know, I think I might watch that third act again. Yeah, maybe the third act. Just kind of a nice little short film. Yeah, for sure. Just because it's Paul Rudd. <laughs> well, and it's also, you know, the great shots of like him cutting through all the people in the medical garb. and Yeah, that's true. There was some neat stuff in there. Like, I love that bit where she sees her son in the other room and goes to tap on the glass and Paul Rudd just pulls her away. Mm. And then they're just sitting there kind of clenched together and then relaxing and then they clench up again because Michael Myers walks into the room right past them. <laughs> I like that there is a lot of emotion to that third act. Yeah. I wish that they could have gone back and redid the film more like that third act. Yeah, they should have shot the whole thing over again. I know that no one would ever approve that in the budget, but yeah. even if it was nonsense just to make it that more visceral, it would have been great. The Weinsteins won't do that for this, but they'll do it for Wes Craven's Cursed, <laughs> where I think they shot like an hour and 10 minutes of that movie again. Wow. They completely changed that movie. And it was still wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't terrible, but yeah. Thank you for listening to the latest installment of Masters of Carpentry. We wish you a happy Halloween, even though this won't be on Halloween. And we'll see you next time for... Uh, vampires. Vampires. Wait, no. Escape from L.A. Don't put any stake in what he said. It won't be vampires. It'll be Escape from L.A. Yeah, I'm still recovering from all the stuff we recorded out of order. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's difficult. But uh, yeah, see you for Escape from L.A. Surf's up. <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. How's it going? Fine. So not only is my Skype recorder working now, but so is the old one that I stopped using two years ago. Oh, weird. How is that even possible? <laughs> I don't know. It just started. It's a ghost. There's a Hackers 2? It was one of those ones where they made a completely separate movie and then they just stuck Hackers on the title to try to sell it. Oh, I see. I think it's like a true story of a real hacker that they took down. Oh. And they were just like, let's put Hackers 2. It was just called the takedown initially. Okay. Bud the Chud situation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Chud 2, Bud the Chud. Yeah, I have a cat that's desperately trying to get my attention here. <laughs> 
It's only when you don't want to pay attention to them that they have to be a part of your world. <laughs> yep. Nope. Nope, cat. You cannot come up on my microphone. Come on. <laughs> this is why I don't live with cats. <laughs> They're really loud. They're really loud? Yeah. Well, why don't you go tell them not to be so loud? I like them so loud. <laughs> then what's the problem? All right. I'm back. Hello. Is anyone there? Have you disappeared? You seem to be on Skype still. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear I me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. I think maybe my, my microphone just got jostled loose. Okay. Okay, no problem. Just make sure it's still recording fine. Uh-oh. Uh, were you recording? Uh, did you get most of the stuff? Yeah, no, it was just while you were talking. Okay, I'm recording now again. I think it was just my my microphone got jostled loose, so it just automatically stopped. Uh, okay, it was probably that cat, that darn cat. Yeah, this cat is still all over the place, and I moved I moved the cord. Get down from the computer! Come on. <laughs> Between this cat and your daughter, we're gonna have plenty of great outtake material. That's true. <laughs> <laughs>